So everybody, you all know our, our, our Joe. This is our Joe. He's been here since 2007, the class of 39. He also retired from the Natural History Museum. That's where he met, met and knew Diana McIntyre, our uh, past curator. Um, Diana was working in mammalogy in the and Joe was working in vertebrate paleontology. He, he retired in 2000 and then was uh, talked into becoming a docent in 2007. So we've had Joe for a while and, and he's our very favorite person. Um, now Joe will start. Okay, we're all here. I guess I guess you're here anyway. Okay, I'll uh, talk about say I'll talk about a small section and then I'll um, ask for questions. Okay. Now let's see if we get this to work. Okay. There we go. Can everybody see that? Okay. I guess they all can. Okay. Can you make it bigger? Can I make it bigger? No. It's full screen for me. It's not full screen for you guys. But have them put it on speaker view that way you can. Maybe put on speaker view. It is on speaker view, and you may need to change your view uh, in the upper right hand corner of your screen. Upper right hand corner or left? Well, on PCs, it's on the upper right hand corner. Hmm. Just a second. I'm having my technician come here. What was that? Okay. If, if you, you have an if you have an Apple device, just pinch it out. Are you talking, who are you talking to? This is Elena. No, I, I know. Have an, but are, I'm you just, are you talking to uh, Joe? No, I'm, I'm talking to whoever, if they want to make it bigger, if they're on oh. like an iPad. Right. Just have to pull their fingers out. It's easier that way than to go in the settings. Okay. I thought you were giving us instructions. No, 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 no. Not you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay. Now, can everybody see this pretty well? Yes. I guess so. Okay. Yes. All right. Oh, Bob, happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> happy birthday, Bob. Happy Thank birthday. You. 80 años. <laughs> Ooh, que bueno. <laughs> what did you just say? I, I insulted Elena. <laughs> uh, okay, we're going to begin now. I'm here in Bluff Cove um, giving this geology talk. And there's some fossils here behind me. You can see them there in the rocks. Okay, uh, do, do you all see the geologic time chart? Yes. Yes. Okay, uh, on the left here is a geologic time chart of the world. And basically it starts, you know, from the Cambrian or pre-Cambrian. And this is how, how things have gone through time up to present times. We have like the early fish, uh, dinosaurs, mammals, they've gone up to present time. Okay, um, all these events actually happened all over the world. Like we talk about um, dinosaurs, for example, they find them today in uh, Utah and Montana, but they were found all over the world, including Palos Verdes. But what happened is they just either didn't become fossilized or if they did become fossilized, over millions of years, the fossil beds eroded away. So, um, that's on the screen there. So, um, like I say, all these periods happened in Palos Verdes, but all this stuff down below below Cretaceous either didn't uh, deposit fossils or if they did, it all eroded away. Okay, now the Cretaceous age here in Palos Verdes, uh, we know Cretaceous is, is a good time for, for uh, dinosaurs. We probably had dinosaurs here. Um, if it was land deposits, if it was an ocean deposit, we'd have uh, you know, like mosasaurs and plesiosaurs, big marine reptiles. So anyway, what happened with the Cretaceous, uh, it's here in Palos Verdes, but it became metamorphosed. And what that means is the Cretaceous beds at one time were pushed way down uh, the lower depths of the, of the surface of the earth, probably about 25 miles. And that depth, heat and pressure uh, condensed it all, metamorphosed those beds into, it's almost like a jade now. So if there were dinosaur bones in there or plants or anything, it all became crushed so bad, you just can't tell anything now. So that we have down here on the right, that's Catalina Schist. It's the oldest uh, uh, fossils, I mean, not the oldest beds we have in, in uh, Palos Verdes. And 
You can find it uh, at Bluff Cove. It looks like I said, it looks like jade, kind of a poor quality jade. And then uh, George F. Canyon is another place for it. So that's the basis, base rock for Palos Verdes. Okay, then uh, above the Cretaceous, we have the, oops, what happened here? Okay. Um, above the Cretaceous, we had the Paleocene, Eocene on up here. Now those beds also were probably deposited here, but they all eroded away. So from the Cretaceous over here on the right, uh, we start with the Altamira Shale sitting on top of the Cretaceous beds. Now this wiggly line means an unconformity, which means a lot of geologic time is missing. Okay. And then same way uh, above the Miocene, we have a little bit of the Pliocene, but most of that eroded away. We have a few little simple beds. They're almost not worth mentioning. And then at the top, we have the Pleistocene, which has a lot of fossils in that too. So basically, we have three periods in Palos Verdes, the Cretaceous, Dinosaur Age, uh, Miocene, 14 to 16 million years old, and then, um, and then the Pleistocene here at the top. Okay, so uh, Catalina Schist, uh, Altamira Shale, 14 to 16 million years old, and then we get the Pleistocene up on top, which is uh, mostly sand deposits. Okay, now I'm going to go through each uh, deposit here. Okay, this is the Altamira Shale. This was uh, taken up by the end of Crest Road, and <clears throat> this is Miocene, 14 to 16 million years old. This was a deep sea deposit, and the reason we can tell that is because we find deep sea fish. Uh, we also find shallow water fish, but a shallow water fish can wash out to sea and sink into deep sea, where a deep sea fish really can't wash up into shallow, shallow beds. So anyway, uh, and these beds are about uh, 2,000 feet thick, and there's fossils all through this stuff. This goes all the way down um, what they call the Burma Road. You can see it there pretty well, too. Okay, uh, when these were being deposited, the beds, uh, this was a deep sea deposit. And like I said, we know it's because we find deep sea fish. Uh, and it was probably like the Catalina Channel is today. It's probably about 3,000 feet deep. And one thing about being so deep, it was probably an anaerobic environment, which means uh, no oxygen, low oxygen level. And so uh, there wasn't much bacteria down there in the depths. And what is nice about that is uh, fossils who normally would uh, be eaten up by predators and stuff like that scavengers, um, they weren't around because there's no oxygen. So fossils and palisades are extremely well preserved. I'll show you something later about that. Okay, so this is the Altamira Shale. You know, sitting right on top of the Altamira Shale is a little bit of here called Valmonte diatomite. Okay, I think we all know what diatoms are. They're, uh, you know, microscopic sea creatures. Uh, they're all through, the, all through this here, but uh, at the end of the Altamira Shale, there became a, an increasing number of um, diatoms into the, the beds. And so we get this basically kind of a chalk layer. I'll show you now. There's the Altamira Shale. I mean, the Valmonte diatomite. This is a, a diatom bed. In each cubic inch of these beds, there's probably millions of diatoms. So I'll show you a picture one here. Maybe I won't. Let's see here. Ah, oh, these are the diatoms. Oops, going on here. There. And these are fossils from the, that same area there. Okay, well, I'm still on the geologic time chart. Let's go back and see if we got any questions. You guys are going to be quizzed at the end of this thing. You better know what you're doing. Okay, we all know about the um, alchemy Wait a minute, Joe. Yeah. I had a yeah. question. Was that Burma Road right at the, when Crenshaw turns into a trail? Yeah, right mm -hmm. there um, at the end of Crenshaw. Yeah, the road goes down. Actually, right across from where I took this photograph, uh, the, there's a big canyon there, and you see the beds going on down there, too. Like I said, about throughout Palos Verdes, there's probably about 2,000 feet of uh, Altamira Shale. Okay, so we'll go on here. Here's the Valmonte diatomite, and some of the diatoms. Okay, this is kind of in the Miocene how uh, fossils were formed. Like I say, the, the ocean depth was probably about 3,000 feet. And these little whales and fish were happily swimming around, and then the whale would die or the fish, and they would settle all the way down to 3,000 feet or whatever depth it was. I think it's, um, and they would uh, become land on the floor of the ocean. Now, because it was anaerobic environment, there probably wasn't much bacteria and you know scavengers 
uh, eating them up. So the stuff pretty well preserved. A good example is we have whale baleen and baleen almost never preserves. And we have it here in Palos Verdes. So they get buried up like this, like this, about 2,000 feet of beds. Then today, as these beds erode away, we end up getting fossils uh, weathering out of the rock like this. Okay, now this is a nice little whale skull. During the Miocene, um, which this, this Altamir Shale is also called Palos Verdes Stone. That was a commercial name for it. So I refer to it as Palos Verdes Stone also. Um, during this time, whales were much smaller than today. This is a, an adult whale skull. And um, it, it's upside down. Here's the brain case, the palate. Here's the lower jaw. And you see the rock hammer here. This is about uh, 11 inches. So you see it's a pretty small whale skull. This is a beautiful uh, dolphin skull. This was actually in a concretion. And a friend of mine took him about four months to prepare this out of the rock. It just came out beautiful. But you see the uh, eyes will be down here. And this is the blowhole and the nose. <coughs> Here's some fossil baleen, which is amazing. Like I say, it, it's, it rots pretty fast when an animal dies. And so it's amazing that it was preserved so well here in Palos Verdes. This would be the upper jawbone and then there's the ba baleen plates. This is at PVIC, I think you've all seen this one. This is a, a small whale, uh, average size actually, and it's on its back. So this would be, um, I think it's changing by itself, hold on here. Okay, so it's on its back. And so this would actually be his left arm here. It's getting the alarm bell. This is the vertebral column. This is what you usually find uh, when you find fossil whales. Most of the skeletons broken up and crumbled. And so here's some vertebrae lined up here. You know, I always tell the whales too, because they have this disc between the vertebrae, which is kind of interesting. This is a beautiful one. This is actually my dad found this. This is a, a whale vertebra that's been ovalized and the rock split open. You can see all the, here's the disc on top. It's interesting how the formation has kind of worked its way around this when it was first deposited. This is the way you can tell uh, you found a whale bone. These are the bone cells, cancellous tissues. Uh, only basically two animals in the world have large cells, I guess, and that's dinosaurs and whales. And since we don't have dinosaurs here now, if you find these, you know, it's a, a whale bone. Uh, most of the animals you find in fossils of Palos Verdes uh, have relatives living today. Uh, most of the sharks and fish and whale, everything do, but this is one exception. This was called a Desmostylus. This is actually one molar. And these things, they look something like a, a hippopotamus, they're not related at all. And they um, lived along the shore and they probably use these teeth for eating clams and stuff like that. And they became extinct um, at the end of the Miocene, of the Desmostylus. This is a nice uh, giant sea lion lower jaw. Here's the canine and the teeth are missing here. But uh, these were really huge. And uh, they've only found two different types of turtles. I don't see why the turtles we have today, the hawksbills and stuff didn't live during this time, but this haven't found any in Palos Verdes. The two they have found are both leatherbacks. Uh, this one is probably very similar to the one we have living today, the big leatherback. And then the other one they found was an extinct uh, smaller leatherback turtle. But these are the plates on the back. Uh, Palos Verdes has some beautiful fish. We get some really neat ones. This is a little herring here. There's an eye and the, uh, the gill plate. Uh, most of the fish you find in Palos Verdes are, are, have fallen apart. So I think that um, before the, in the areas that they're located, I think they probably fell apart before they were totally uh, fossilized. So a lot of times you just find scales and little bones and stuff like that. Here's a nice uh, croaker. This is a pretty big one. It's about a foot long. And it's interesting here on uh, this other one, you can see the actual bones in the rock. You see all the bones here. This one, the bones are actually weathered away and you just have a outline where the bones used to be in the skeleton. These are all from Palos Verdes, all these. Here's a beautiful one. This is found by Lanata Bay. It's a dolphin. I mean, it's a uh, uh, halibut. It's a halibut skull. You know, the head, how the head rotates. Unfortunately, the back part was missing, but uh, this is actually in the, the PVIC collection. 
to the mouth and the teeth. This is interesting. These are herring. And um, they probably, I'm sure they had red tide back then like we do today. And we have these mass uh, extinctions. So um, I'm just gonna get the, okay. okay, a lot of sales calls. So um, <clears throat> this was probably a result of a red tide and you get all these fish die in one spot, it's called a mass mortality. And so um, you find these slabs that, and sometimes there's just hundreds of dead fish all died at the same time. This is uh, also what's in our collection. This is a, a viper fish and it confirms that it's a deep sea deposit because these leave down you know, many thousands of feet deep. And what's really interesting about this, besides having the, all the teeth and the eye here, uh, if you notice inside, it's his last meal, the little skeleton of a fish he ate. There's actually the tail, the head's gone, but this was actually, uh, he ate this fish and then he died. Mm. Died with a full stomach. This is one Iveta found, it's beautiful. It's just been uh, split in half and these little rock fish. Not very often do you find both halves like that together. This is a pipefish, of course. And you know, pipefish live in back bays. And so um, what would probably happen here, obviously happened is, is during a flood or a, a storm or something, this fish probably died and washed way out to sea and then you know he was dead and his body sank down to 3,000 feet and then became fossilized in the, the deep sea beds. This is a beautiful fish. I am able to identify it, but it's, uh, it's about two inches long, but the detail is just incredible. All, every little bones in the thing, the tail, absolutely beautiful. Here's some fish scales. This is usually what you find a lot in Powell's birds are fish scales, they're very common. And just about every rock, you break open and Paul's Verdes and the Altamira Shale will have fish scales in it. This is a really neat one. Uh, what I think this is, here's a fish scale, by the way. So you see how small this is. It's about a half inch long. And um, I think this is a larva of a halibut because, you know, halibut start out as little free swimming fish. And then as they grow up, they, you know, lay on their sides and their heads turn and all that. But I think this is actually a halibut uh, larva. This is found up on Crest Road and Crenshaw. They, they built that church up there, um, St. John, whatever it is. Okay. But this was found in the parking lot when they were excavating. Wow. This is also another deep sea fish. It's called a hatchet fish. You see its eye here, a little bit of the nose, man. There's its uh, up, uh, its mouth facing upward. Beautiful little fossil here. This guy's about two inches long. Here's an extremely rare, these things are rare today. And this is the only one I know of in the fossil record. It's called an Oreo fish, found here in Pospertes. I don't know why they call it an Oreo fish, but that's the name of them. But anyway, they're very rare. And this, of course, our shark at uh, PVIC we have on display in the sea cave. This is when we, uh, when I was working on it to get it all together in pieces. Uh, what's interesting about this, like I say, it was an anaerobic environment which just kind of proves it because uh, shark vertebrae are made out of cartilage and usually they rot away. So all you find is the shark teeth. So not only do we have the teeth, but we have the vertebral column and we even have the dorsal fin. The, you see all those braces there in the, the dorsal fin. So it's very interesting that this thing uh, died and was, and was preserved so fast. Something kind of interesting about this fossil, everything is so well preserved and lined up, nothing's rotted or moved, but yeah, have a huge break here um, so maybe it was the reason the thing died. Maybe something hit it or got in a battle or something and killed it. But it's weird that everything else is in place and this section here is broken. So no telling. We may never know. Huh. Okay, and this is, uh, of course, the big megalodon. And you see the serrations along here. Beautiful. This was found down by Point Furman. Beautiful teeth. This one's uh, about five and a half inches long. From there to here. And these are definitely the the head predators, because like I said, the whales were small. The whales are maybe 30 feet, and these things could be up to 30 feet, even longer. So um, I'm sure they had no trouble catching and eating these small whales. And the reason they probably became extinct is because whales got larger, um, the white shark came into existence. And so the young megalodons had to compete with the baby, I mean, with adult white sharks. 
So probably a lot of reasons like that, they be, but they became extinct at the end of the Miocene. What is that? A little line here. Anyway, I don't know what that is. Ah, huh, that's so weird. Well, I gotta live with that blue line, whatever it is. Okay, this is a, a backbone, a, a vertebra of a whale. Uh, and what's interesting is, you know, the megalodons fed on these whales and you see the big bite mark here from the tooth, just chomped around the boat. And what's interesting here is the serrations on the megalodon tooth. You can actually see the serrations right here where it um, did a second bite. But that's probably, you know, killed the whale, just bit him right in the back and killed him. Here's a little called Carcharhinus. Uh, this could be a bull shark, a dusky shark, a different one like that, but it's they're kind of a common little shark tooth. And this is a tiger shark, really nice one. Same, uh, very similar to the species living today, it might even be the same species. This is one Yvette I found. This is a snaggletooth shark, Hemapricetus, and beautiful tooth. Roots missing, but now uh, that's also at PVIC. This is a really rare, this is a uh, mantis shrimp. Yeah. It's about two inches long, but you see that actually the little uh, grabbers in the front here, the, the head and the tail, no little feet. Beautiful specimen. Yeah, I say these are all from Palisperti. Here's a shrimp, which is kind of cool. You can see its eye and then the body. And for some reason, this is all a natural coloring. Um, the tail came out of kind of a yellow color, which is really neat. This is also about two inches long. A nice crab. There's his right eye, left eye over here, and his right pincher. This thing's about an inch and a half long across. This is interesting because uh, this is a Miocene, in a Pleistocene, we get a lot of shells. But uh, in the Altamira Shale, we get almost no shells at all. So this was a, a moon snail. They are in shallow water. So I think what probably happened is sometimes when these things die, a uh, gas is built up in them. So it could have had a gas bubble in it and it could have washed out to sea and then sunk into the deep uh, deep sea deposit to be fossilized. So this is a moon snail uh, from a 3,000 foot deep deposit. So it had to have washed in there somehow. This is uh, an interesting, because this is a, a scallop, and um, they're not deep water, but over by Point Furman, there's a kind of a gravel layer over there, and I, I think it must have been a more shallow area, because uh, these could live down several hundred feet, but um, in this gravel layer, they do find some seashells. It's Miocene. This is a beautiful piece of petrified wood. So it was about three feet long. This is, let me see the knot right there, the knot over here. Uh, the petrified wood from Palos Verdes, is, it's actually pretty common, but when you find it, it's black. Uh, this is an exception. It's usually this color here, down here, dark color. And when you saw it in half, it's just totally black. There's no structure at all. So what we do is we cut it in half and polish the black um, fossil wood. And then we soak it in bleach for about three or four days and actually brings out all the, the grain in it. So when this was first cut, it was just solid black, and then now it's got this going out. Uh, leaves are uh, not real rare, but you do find them there occasionally. I'm not sure what kind of a plant, a tree this is from. This is a beautiful pine cone. It's only one half, and the other half wasn't there, luckily. I mean, unfortunately. <clears throat> And here's um, some eelgrass, which the pipefish live in. This probably also washed out from a, a little back bay or something like that in the deep water and sank. Okay, we've covered the Miocene. Uh, any questions about that? 14 to 16 million years old, um, Altamira shale, Palisades stone. Okay, gotcha. Joe, I have one question. Um, when you say that the Altamira uh, layer is 2,000 feet, where is that today? Is that like still under sea level or all? No, you can Minnesota actually, if you go to, uh, if you go to uh, the end of Crenshaw, you know, the Burma road that goes down. Uh -huh. If you stand there, that one picture I took on the left, you look on the right and you see these canyons going way down and you've got, you know, many thousands of feet of, of beds there. 
that's probably the best place to see the entire uh, layer of the Altamira Shale is right there um, on the other side of Crenshaw. Okay, Burnham. so it's pushed up to like the top of the hill and then still some underwater or? Oh yeah, some are still buried, of course. Yeah, some is down okay. underneath. All yeah. right, cool, thank you. Okay. All right. Joe, yeah. Uh, Joe, I have a question. Uh, you just showed some wood that from the Miocene era. Right. I didn't realize that we hit any trees or anything that would have been here at that time because I thought this was all underwater. Oh, it was, but uh, all this stuff washes in from rivers and stuff during floods. Ah. Just like today, I mean, I'm sure you've been across the Catalina Channel and you see a log floating out there or something. So this stuff just washes out from the, the land deposits. Okay, uh, here in Palos Verdes, it was probably about 3,000 foot beds. But during the same time over in Barstow, you know, bar, where Barstow is, uh, that same age, but they find land mammals there. So right. there could have been some rivers and stuff and this stuff all just washed out from far away. And the vast inland sea of the, the Central Basin, LA Basin. Yeah. Okay, second question. Mm -hmm. You mentioned early on when we, you started talking about Miocene, some mammal, I believe, called a Desmo something, and I didn't get uh -huh. I, I I was curious as to how to spell that. <laughs> I'll have to look at my book. <laughs> no, I think it's just like it sounds. Let me check. Can you get a picture of that blue line? Well, I'm looking that up. I'll have my, uh, my wonderful technician here get rid of this blue line. And I don't know where that came from. Looks like there's a drawing or something. Okay. With a pen. Looks like it's on the slide. Mm -hmm. I don't think I can do anything with that. Not on any other slide. Mm -hmm. No. No. Well, it got to be here somewhere. Let me look it up. Look right here, I think. Anyway, um, <laughs> I can't remember. Yeah, here it is. Okay, it's. Um, you want the scientific name or the common name? The common name is Desmos, not the D-E-S-M-O-S-T-Y-L-U-S. Thank you, sir. That's the common name, yeah. Actually, the scientific name is Desmos Stylus Hesperus. Hesperus, okay. So you gave me all enough right. so I can look it up. Yeah, it's a, it's a, they find it all on our coast and um, over all the way over to Japan. But they just lived during the Miocene and they died out into the, the Miocene. Interesting. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Now we're going to, we covered the, remember the uh, Miocene, uh, basically, the, except for the Catalina Schist, it's the earliest bed. Uh, almost every rock you pick up in Palos Verdes is Altamira Shale. Okay. Palos Verdes stone. Um, and then along the top, I'll show you some more here now. Okay. Um, about a million years ago or a little less, Here's the Catalina Schist, remember the basic bedrock. Here's the Altamira Shale. And it was probably, you know, 3,000 feet deep when it was deposited. Okay, uh, a time went by where not much happened, but okay, about a million years ago or a little less, uh, with plate tectonics and movements, all this started pushing up like this. So about, oh, 500,000 years ago to a million years ago, uh, this Altamira Shale, 14 to 16 million year old Altamira Shale, broke the surface of the ocean here. And we call this little lump Palos Verdes Island. Okay, when this pushes through and you have this land sticking out of the ocean, uh, you get wave action and you actually cut little uh, sea cliffs on the side as it lifts up. And then you get the, all the stuff that washes out of the sea cliff, washes down into the, the beds of the ocean. <coughs> now, um, as time goes by, you get more beds here. You see the different layers here? So this would be an old sea cliff, an old sea cliff. These are called uh, marine terraces. And we have 13 of these in Palos Verdes, 13 uh, definite marine terraces. Okay. Does everybody understand that? I guess so. Okay. So I can't hear you, but I guess you can say, yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, here's uh, from the Redondo Beach Pier, you can see the marine terraces at Palos Verdes. Okay. Um, this thing keeps changing here. I'm having a little trouble. Okay. Um, the up here would be the, when it was first island, this would be the upper part of the island, right? This would be all underwater. And so he's, as it came up out of the water, it started forming these little sea cliffs. Right there. So that's an old ancient sea cliff, you know, maybe two or 300,000 years old. And this would be the ocean floor. 
Then you get another sea cliff here and more ocean floor and on down like that. Okay, here's one from, uh, I mean, Terrania looking towards San Pedro. Same thing, the earlier ones are wounded off, rounded off. And as you get down to the more recent times, they're a little more definite here. And these towers on top, you know, the domes, I don't think you can see that, but the, the, right, the big white radar domes, uh, that's where Palos Verdes first became an island. That's the highest spot. And they actually can find fossil shells up there right around the domes. Okay, so you can see them here. Let me show you one more example. This is a uh, 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 Ladera Linda looking uh, toward um, Terrania. And same thing here. This is the old sea floor. Uh, the remains of a sea cliff, they're kind of weathered away. Here, you see one here and down here. Now what's interesting here is um, our coves we have in here. Okay, during the time when the Altamir Shale was being deposited, when the Altamir Shale was being deposited, uh, we had some uh, basalt uh, intrusive dikes, they called them, they came up through the beds. Okay, now um, you've been to the tide pools, I think it's on automatic, I think here. You go to the tide pools and um, they're all made up of basalt, not Altamir Shale. So when the wave action comes in, it cuts away the Altamir Shale, but these uh, uh, basalt dikes sticking out here protect it. And so that's why we have coves here because of the dikes. So most of the tide pools are actually basalt and they're not uh, Altamir Shale. Did everybody get that? Okay, now if you could cut this in half, I'm gonna show you what it would look like inside. So here's the one we were looking at, the marine terraces. And here's Long Point. Okay, if you cut them in half, you see here's the Altamira Shale, the basic to all the Palos Verdes. And then you have these uh, marine terraces cutting through. These are the old, old sea cliffs. And you have uh, tide pools at the bottom here. Same way to another uh, sea floor, tide pool, sea cliff. And they kind of fade out as they get up higher. I said, we do have 13 of them here though. And then you have present day sea cliff and the tide pools. Okay, I'm gonna show an example of this. Now remember Altamir Shale, the fossil shells and the soil, topsoil on top. And here's my lovely wife standing on a marine terrace. So um, this is the topsoil and this is the uh, tide pools, you might say would have the shells in it. And then this is the uh, Altamir Shale down here. It's a little crumbled up, but this is so, uh, Things on automatic, I think, here. Something's going on. Sorry, you're touching the mouse. Oh, not. <laughs> anyway, so this is again uh, the topsoil, the tide pools, and then the Altamira Shale. So we got um, a couple hundred thousand to 500,000 year age here. And then you have 14 to 16 million year age here. And this is recent on top. And this is uh, right here, these tide pools. This is what they look like. Here's the tide pool rumble, rubble, and then down below here is the Altamira Shale, it's sitting on top of the Altamira Shale. Okay, okay when Palos Verdes first came up, um, it was, as an island, it was pretty far offshore. The old shoreline was way back in here. There's Los Angeles, Santa Monica Mountains. So this was a small little Palos Verdes island. Uh, this is the outline of the land today. Everybody get that? Okay, so as the island grew, um, here it is here, it's getting to be where it was. So um, eventually, as it got bigger and bigger, it connected to the mainland and it's called a land bridge. Um, I'm sure you've all driven down Pacific Coast Highway from Redondo Beach and where it turns and heads east towards South High, you drive through a, a, a road cut there. I think you've all seen that. That was probably the uh, original land bridge. It was probably blown sand from all the sand dunes here. Uh, the island was probably pretty close. And then uh, the sand blew and, and made a land bridge. So once the land bridge connected Palos Verdes to the mainland, then you had all these animals found on the tar pits, the very tar pits. They could all walk across and, and live here on the island to, on Palos Verdes then too. So there was probably a few animals that washed on the shore uh, before that, but once the land bridge connected, then we had all this influx of uh, Pleistocene mammals coming across. Uh, it's interesting because today uh, we find fossil shells around Palos Verdes on the marine terraces. Uh, some in Playa del Rey, it's all been covered up, but Newport Back Bay, Newport Beach has huge fossil shell deposits down there, just amazing. 
but it's all the same age, probably where you stand. This shows you what some of those um, marine beds look like. Is all the shells all mixed in there with the sand. You see how abundant in some areas. I mean, there are just millions of shells. And this is the place to see uh, less than a million years old. Let me, uh, any more questions about the Pleistocene and the, and any of this at all? Joe? Yeah. Can you talk, you were talking about the tide pools and the basalt dike. Yeah. And then, then you talk, and then in your, it's like Greek to me. And then um, you're in your diagram, you're just talking about Pleistocene tide pools. Can you clarify that? Sure. Yeah. Let me go back. Um, Am I going back? Yeah. Uh, like this here? Yeah. Yeah, this is, um, like I say, these are the marine terraces as they lifted up. And so this was uh, one of the earliest sea cliffs when it was a little island. And then same, another sea cliff, they're, they're weathering away with time. And then we have this, uh, the tide pools in here. Okay, now, a lot of the tide pools we see today are in basalt that have pushed through the Altamira Shale. Uh, there's also tide pools like these that were probably just uh, on the Altamira Shale. Okay. And then what about this, you know, for the land bridge, you were showing pictures of where the sand was. Where yeah. were those pictures taken? What's that again? Where were those pictures taken? This one here? Oh, wait. Okay, that one. That one? That one. Yeah. yeah. That's actually the Palos Verde sand formation uh, down at Newport Beach, this particular one here. It's all the same beds that run, runs from Newport Beach all the way up to Palos Verdes. But it was just a good exposure, so I, I, I took that in there. Okay. In here, yeah. And where's that? This is uh, also this Palos Verde sand formation that went down into Newport Beach area. Got it. Okay. So much of Palos Verdes is built over; it's hard to find uh, sites like this now to show people. But down there and, and there, you still uh, see a lot of this stuff. Okay. Um, Let's like say the land bridge. Do we understand about how that went, worked? Uh, all the animals from the Brea Tar Pits uh, migrated into Palos Verdes. So just about every animal in Palos Verdes, I mean, in uh, the La Brea Tar Pits has been found in Palos Verdes. But in the Tar Pits, you may find dozens and dozens of complete skeletons or skulls, where in Palos Verdes, we might just find a tooth, but it represents a saber-toothed hat or whatever, OK? Um, interesting story. This is our state fossil. I think you all knew that. Uh, Smilodon californicus, California Smilodon. Um, and so it's always been accepted as our state fossil because of the name. Well, the way the scientific committee works, whatever's named first, that name is true. And so if you find a fossil and name it, then 10 years later, someone finds the same fossil and names it a different name, your name holds true because you named it first. Okay, after we became state fossil Smilodon californicus, uh, they realized back in the turn of the century, a guy found one of these in Florida and named it Smilodon Fatalis. So that's the official name. So our state fossil now is Smilodon Fatalis and not Californicus, but it's still our state fossil. So, and here's a, a dire wolf skull. Dire wolf is probably the most common carnivore uh, during the Pleistocene here in Palos Verdes. This is actually a cast, but here's a real uh, tooth from San Pedro a little jaw section. They're probably pretty abundant animals, a lot of, okay. Uh, this is a, a mammoth tooth. Uh, I got an interesting story with this. This came from Chandler's Sand and Gravel. And, uh, oh, probably 40 years ago, I, uh, I found this piece on the ground, this piece here, it was kind of weathered. And um, I looked up on the cliff about 10 feet up and this piece was, was still in the cliff. So what happened is that weathered out, this piece broke off and this stayed protected in the sand. So you see this little better condition than this here, but it's, it's all from the same tooth. So anyway, mammoths now, okay, mammoths were grass eaters. And believe it or not, a mammoth in its entire skull only has four teeth. They have uh, two on the upper part and two in the lower jaw. So one on each side. So they only have four teeth. But of course, teeth erupt and, um, you know, they always have uh, new teeth come in. They may have, uh, I don't know, maybe five to nine sets of teeth. But at one time, they only have four teeth actually in their skull being used. Okay, so this is the mammoth. They were probably about 12 feet tall at the shoulders. 
And then we have the mastodon, which was a, looked like a smaller elephant. They're probably about six feet tall at the shoulders. And they had uh, eight teeth in their head. They had uh, two on each side, upper and lower. And these were adapted, the mammoth ate grass. These ate twigs and leaves and more coarser food. That's why they have a different kind of a tooth. They're, they're distantly re relatives, but not too close. This is the American Mastodon. There's an old fossil, digging up an old fossil. That's a bison skull. The bisons were the most common uh, plant eating herbivores in the, during the Pleistocene of Palos Verdes. This is the same, that, I don't know why that was out of focus, but this is the same skull. And I was photobombed, you see the lizard up there? I didn't realize that until after I uh, got home with the picture. But you see where it was weathering out here. This, this part was exposed and this was all back in the sand. This is a bison uh, right uh, upper jaw, you might say. The eye would be right here. And this is the nose. And this is a lower jaw of a bison, bison antiquus, which is extinct now. They probably evolved into the bison we have today. Uh, they, everyone seems to think they are, but this was, a, was an extinct one. A lot bigger than the bison we have today. Uh, these are fossil horse teeth from Palos Verdes. This is an upper, the big square ones, and the lower teeth are the longer ones like this here. Uh, okay, I got an interesting story with this thing. Then I'll ask any questions. Um, I found this up at Lanada Bay, the, the canyon up there. It's called uh, something like bad water. What is it? The mm -hmm. uh, Agua Amar or something. It means it means the the Agua Amargo. Yeah, the bitter water is the, the official name of it, but everybody calls it Lanada Canyon, Lanada Bay. Okay, I found this uh, late in the afternoon, and it, as it came out of the cliff, it was all breaking up, and so I took all these pieces home, glued them all together. And, then, and luckily, I have a very understanding wife. Uh, I noticed this piece was missing. I, oh, man, I could have gone back the next day. But no, I went back up that night, with, that night with the flashlight and dug around and found it and brought it home. So now it's all complete. <laughs> but just can't wait till the next day to get that missing piece. So anyway, this is a horse femur, uh, right femur. This is the, the socket into the pelvis. Do you have any questions so far? I guess doing OK. Uh, Joe, yeah. on that dire wolf, how big was it? I mean, they it, were uh, just a little bit bigger than a timber wolf. So that jaw was like, like an adult timber wolf, right? Yeah, like maybe three or four inches long, that jaw. Yeah, a little piece. Yeah. But they were a little bigger than timber wolf and probably very abundant. Okay, and here's yeah. actually a, a horse hoof, which is kind of neat. And uh, the hoof part actually goes over the bone. This is the bone part. Okay, any more questions? Joe, mm -hmm. uh, I understood that horses became extinct here in the North America and then were brought back from Europe. That's true. Uh, these are the Pleistocene horses. And um, a lot of these animals, I mean, it's, it's debated, but a lot of these animals did become extinct from overhunting by the native, I mean, the Paleo Indians. And I think the Paleo Indians probably did uh, kill off the horses too. Because uh, about 12,000 years ago, almost all the megafauna, which is horses, bison, uh, elephants, mammoths, about 12,000 years ago, almost all the megafauna in North America became extinct. And, you know, a few thousand years before that is when the Paleo Indians evolved into the area. Uh, so I think, I mean, most people now accept the fact, they used to say climate change, but most people accept the fact now that things were just overhunted. They, they had no idea that the, things would run out. And you don't blame them, they had to feed their families. It's just one of those things that happened. But I think uh, over hunting really, and of course, it, like I said, it did wipe out the horse. And then the Spanish brought them and it um, became a lot of wild horses too. Okay. This is uh, Regina, I mean, no, uh, Ra Raquel, the whale that was found in San Pedro back in about 1972. And I worked at the Natural History Museum then, and this is me here when I had hair. And this is Paul Kirkland, the guy that uh, found the whale. Actually, when he found it, the whale, we removed some of it already, took it to the museum, but the, the of course, here's the head and the, the, the thorax. Uh, way back here, 
was the tip of the tail, and that's all they found sticking out of a cliff was the tip of the tail. So when the museum come, we, we came, we had to remove all this uh, cliff was on top of it. It took us probably a month to collect this thing every day. But uh, yeah, all they found was the tip of the tail going into the cliff. This is the exact same species as the California gray whale we have today. This is a nice dolphin uh, skull. This is the eyes would be over here and in the blowhole, the nose. There's a beautiful little rabbit skull. <clears throat> it's only about an inch and a half long. One thing about rabbits, most rodents have, you know, two big uh, incisors in the front. Rabbits, they, they still have two big incisors, but they're like divided. So it almost looks like they have four incisors in the front. So then this is another Pleistocene rabbit. Probably same species that lives here today. Here's a cormorant skull, as it was found in the dirt or the soil. See all the shells in it with it. So the thing obviously died in a, a marine deposit. This is uh, usually the fish bones you find with all the fossil shells. That was the sheep's head. Um, most of these are sheep's head. This is the throat teeth and some vertebrae. Uh, this is a white shark from the Pleistocene deposit. This thing's almost three inches long. Beautiful. It is upper tooth and the lower tooth. Uh, some reasons the white sharks seem like they might have been a little more abundant during the Pleistocene than they are today because uh, you do find a fair number of their teeth in the fossil beds. You see all the damage here on the side was probably from feeding, broke the serrations off. This is a beautiful, uh, it's called a three-winged three -winged murex. They still live today here. This is a beautiful specimen. The same thing is when they died, you know, it depends. If they died and just got buried in soft sand, then you get these beautiful specimens. But if they get tumbled around in the surf before they fossilize, then you don't um, get very good specimens. This is a big Belcher's murex. It still lives here today. This is an interesting shell. It's called Leanne's uh, murex. And um, they're not real rare in the Pleistocene apostrophes. Uh, you know, they're not common, but they're not rare. Um, today, these things are deep water and more down into Mexico. So for some reason they change their environment, but they do find them here in Palos Verdes. But now it's a deep sea and more of a Mexican uh, murex. This is a beautiful shell. This is a nutmeg. And I don't know why almost all these shells we find in the fossils of Palos Verdes are still living today. But this nutmeg became extinct. I mean, it's nice. It's a large shell, about three inches long. And there's other nutmegs that are still living that lived with this guy. But for some reason, they just um, became extinct. Here's the wavy top or wavy turban. Still get that today here along the coast. Pretty common. And then the um, moon snail, Drake's moon snail. No, excuse me, this is um, Lewis's moon snail. This is kind of interesting. This was found across from the ports of call in the cliff there. And uh, this is called a tabled tubulata or um, Neptunia tubulata. And these are a deep sea uh, snail. So it shows that these beds across from there were actually a deeper uh, beds when this was, was fossilized. This is the abalone shell. This was found up by the, those big um, radar domes at the top of the hill. So this was uh, living around Palos Verdes when it was a real small island when it first uh, popped up out of the ocean. Uh, this is one of the early habitats of that little island. Uh, chestnut cavalry, everybody likes those. This is a beautiful called a weather vane scallop. These can get up to about eight inches across. And um, some areas in Palos Verdes are pretty abundant or they were around San Pedro, but a lot of the beds are covered up now. And this is a gaper clam. I think we all know about those. They have that long neck that sticks out. They bury themselves in the sand and kind of hard to collect them. And a pismal clam. These are found above Trump's golf course. And like I say, the, um, the further up you go in Palos Verdes, the older the fossils will be, just the opposite, because normally the deeper things are, the older they are, but because the way the island came up out of the ocean, the upper parts of Palos Verdes are the older beds and the lower the newer beds. This is really interesting. This is at City Hall 
And I really hope we can get it moved down to the front of PVIC. It'd be a beautiful, it's a huge rock. It probably weighs hundreds of pounds. But what this is, is um, this is Altamir Shale, 14 to 16 million years old. But this was in a tide pool during the Pleistocene, so maybe several hundred thousand years ago. And sea urchins actually uh, bored these out to keep from being washed away by the waves. So we call them sea urchin garages. And so um, I left their mark on this. Beautiful specimen, like I say it's probably eight feet across. And um, I just hope we someday we get it moved down to the, the front of our museum. Okay, I'm gonna tell you another little story. Some reason this is out of focus, but, um, oh, I don't know, about five years ago now, I was, high, this is Lanata Canyon again, where I found that horse bone. Um, right in this area here, I'll show you some better pictures. At the bottom of this cliff, I found this uh, bison pelvis sticking out. And it was from the bison antiquus, the extinct one, so I knew it had to be at least 12,000 years old or older. Here's another picture of the, you see the big, um, about 20 feet of overburden and it was right down here on the bottom. Uh, this is actually where I found it with the rock hammers. It's interesting, it was in this soft sand which preserved it because all these rocks just would have crushed it. So every day it got buried in the soft sand and then all this stuff came on top of it, it was preserved in there. I'll tell you the story about that bison pelvis in a minute here. Okay, this, this is where I found it right down here. Uh, this was an ancient canyon. As you can see here, see how this is a diff different color compared to this over here? It's a plants too, I mean, but um, so this is the canyon wall. I'll show you a picture out in a minute. And this was the, oh, the base of the canyon, and then the other wall came up here. So it's actually an ancient canyon that filled in with dirt, and then the present day canyon cut through the, the layers and exposed that bison pelvis. Here's another example. This is uh, where that pelvis was found. And you see these all these layers of this ancient canyon. And then here's the Altamira Shale. This was the edge of the canyon, right here. So I think it's about this. I think you all know about owl pellets. Uh, when an owl eats a little rodent or a little critter, um, it doesn't pass it through. It, it digests it, and then it spits out the bones on a little pellet called an owl pellet. Um, I think when, um, I know that when this was a, a canyon, back about 13,000 years ago, um, owls lived along the top of it here and they would spit out those owl pellets like they do today un under a tree or wherever they live, you can find these owl pellets. Anyway, in a little area right here, only about three feet wide, I found hundreds of rodent bones, no place else, just this one little spot. So it must've been owls living up here and then they dropped their pellets down here and then it became fossilized. Uh -huh. neat. Okay, now here's that pelvis I found doesn't look like much. Here's the where the femur were going there. Okay. And here's another view of it. Some reason they're out of focus, but you see these little marks up here? Yeah. Those are, actually, those are actually cut marks. So what it was is this bison, it was over 12,000 years old because that's when it became extinct. Uh, this thing had been butchered by Paleo Indians. As you, I think you probably know this on display at the interpretive center, but I'll go over it again. And there's about five cut marks here where someone had cut this thing and butchered it uh, over 12,000 years. So they dated it. They couldn't use any uh, carbon-14 dating because there wasn't any collagen in it. So they used an um, optical simulation luminescent uh, method. And what it does, it actually, it you get the surrounding feldspar crystals found with this and you can see the last time they saw sunlight. So what we had to do is we had to go up into the canyon at night where this was found, the picture here. And we had to go back up in that canyon at night, a moonless night, and we had to cover this whole area with black tarps. And then we had to dig back about, um, about 18 inches to get into soil that had never seen sunlight. Because we took some soil out and it saw the sunlight, it would essentially set the clock back to zero. So we, we got a chunk of virgin soil out of here and uh, wrapped it in black plastic and everything and took it back to a lab at Long Beach State. And they did the um, optical stimulation luminescence dating on it. And they came out, they dated 13 times and the dates all came out around 13,500 years ago. So this is the oldest signs of uh, humans in California, most likely. 
So that was kind of neat. It's right here in Palos Verdes. So anyway, here's the bone again. And here's the cut marks. Can't see very well on this photo. Some reason, a little out of focus, but uh, you can actually. Oh, so another thing they did too, they uh, did electron microscope of these cuts. And when you, um, like when you sharpen a knife or when you hit certain kinds of flint or chert, they break with certain angles. Now, um, they studied this angle under um, electron microscope and the angle they think it was probably uh, obsidian blade because the way obsidian breaks, breaks and stuff. So I think this was cut 13,500 years ago uh, by an obsidian blade. I, this is just something I got off the internet, but it's probably what it was. It was probably uh, maybe just a couple of bison down in this little, in this ancient canyon that I showed you. And then they, um, they killed them and butchered it right there on the spot. The Indians that lived during the Paleo Indians, uh, they probably didn't have villages or anything. They're probably just nomadic. They just moved around and got food where they could. It's interesting too, the Paleo Indians of this time, they don't seem like they um, utilize the seashore at all. All the food they have are, are basically land, land animals, which is kind of interesting. Okay. Does anyone know what a pseudo fossil is? <laughs> this is yeah, a like natural a occurrence. This is a, a rock with uh, natural borings in it. Looks like a monkey skull, though. And that's all. We're all done. Is a pseudo fossil like a lever, right? Yeah. A uh, pseudo fossil looks like a fossil, and you might want to keep it. Now, lever right, if you pick up a rock and there's no crystals or fossils in it, you leave it right where you found it. Oh, okay. That's right. <laughs> you clarified okay. it. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, are there any questions? Yeah, Joe, uh, is there any indication of where the Paleo Indians originally came from? Did they come across the Alaska land bridge? Did the Paleo Indians what? Did they come across the Alaska land bridge? Oh, probably. I think all everybody that, yeah, that got here had to go that way. Uh, there's always talk that they built boats and stuff, but they probably just came along the shoreline. That's why we don't find much um, remains of them because the uh, you know, 13, 15, 20,000 years ago, when they did come down the coast, uh, the, the sea level has risen. And so most of those paleo sites are all covered up right now. That's why they don't let too much uh, results from that. But yeah, everything had to come over the straits that way. Yeah. Okay. Okay, you guys are all, are you ready for your quiz now? <laughs> Joe, Joe, this is a dog quiz today. <laughs> Uh, one more, one more question, Joe. Yeah. Um, the, so the Paleo Indians were here first, and then at some point in time, the uh, Indians from Nevada, Utah, Arizona, etc., the Shoshone uh, uh, language group uh, came over and became the Tongva, uh, which which weren't called Tongva at the time, obviously, but. Uh, any information about uh, why the Paleo Indians died out and the others came in to um, supplant them? Were they were there wars or anything uh, in the transition? Anybody know? Yeah, one thing is um, they're doing a lot of DNA now, and they have found that some of the very first ones that can you know get DNA from 13,000, 15,000 years ago uh, have descendants today. You know, like Navajos and and like that. I'm not sure exact which ones, but um, they just uh, evolved into different people. I mean, they, did, they didn't all of a sudden, the paleo didn't become extinct or die out. And then other uh, tribe, they just, one thing about humans, even uh, early humans, um, two things they did is they migrated and they bred. And uh, so you just get all this mixture of people from different tribes, running into other people of different tribes, having kids, and they moved to some other area. And uh, humans are notorious for just migrating and, and breeding. And uh, that's why it's so hard to, pinpoint a lot of this DNA stuff because it's just all over the place. Mm, okay, thanks. Hey, Joe, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, you talked about wolf and I guess it died out in the PD area. So what's remaining is just our coyote and our ox. So what happened? Why did the dire wolf die out in our area? Well, I didn't quite get the question. Why did the big animals and not the coyotes and stuff? The dire wolf. Why'd he die out? Okay, uh, that's a good question. Uh, probably what it is, um, a lot of the animals that lived during that time are still around. Uh, mountain lions, because they have a very 
uh, hide in the mountains type of lifestyle. Uh, coyotes are small and can get around, foxes, so like that. They all survived because they were very adaptable. Um, um, but things like you know mammoths and dire wolves, and they all depended on the big megafauna. So the dire wolves fed, I'm sure, on, on camels and, and uh, horses and bison a lot. Of course, when they died out, uh, it was harder for the um, dire wolves to survive. Where something like a coyote, they'll eat anything. And same with mountain lions, they were more stealth, you might say. So I think it just the way they were able to adapt. Where dire wolves are probably in big packs and they attack, you know, buffalo and all that stuff, bison. And I think they just, when all the big game died out, they just died out with it. Same with saber tooth yeah. cats. Saber tooth cats probably fed only on the larger uh, prey. That's why they also died out. Hi, it's Bill Brogan. Can you hear me? Yeah, good. Oh, hi, Joe. Hey, thanks. Great lecture, and I uh, had a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. Hello, okay. everybody. You didn't fall asleep? Hey, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Let me pinch myself. Okay. <laughs> okay. Joe, I, I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, can you re-explain where that land bridge was along PCH? Yeah, okay, you come down uh, PCH and it, it turns right where, remember the plush horse and all that stuff there? Yes. Okay, turns there and it heads east. Right. Okay. You don't go too far, you go past Anza and there's a, a hill there, the road cuts through the hill. Okay. And, and, then, and you keep on going, you hit Cali Mare and then um, South High. So right. it's the one that's just west of Cali Mare, and it's, it's it's all sand dune. You look at the road cut; and it's all sand. So it probably okay. just probably just blew in and, and became a land bridge. Okay, thank yeah. you. That's interesting. Yeah. Some of the areas around San Pedro and Wilmington, uh, they may have ample to access there, but oh, even even a hundred years ago, the area was very marshy and low. So I don't think it'd be that good. It probably uh, hard to walk through that. You know, years ago, but I just, I think it was the one there right over there by Cali Mare. Interesting. Ooh. Thank you. Uh -huh. Now, this is Adela. I had a question also. Uh, for some reason, I didn't quite grasp how Palos Verdes Island grew to connect with the mainland. Well, yeah, it, uh, the plate tectonics started pushing these, these beds up. Here we go. Um, started pushing these beds up, and it just happened to break the surface. Uh, you know, out in the ocean where Palos Verdes is now. Huh. And so uh, it just, as it grew, it finally connected to the mainland. Oh. Like so what, what streets or whatever would be the border of the original island? I'm sorry, what was that? What would be the, the uh, outline, the streets that would correspond with the outline of the original island? That's a good question. You know where the radar domes are up on the hill, those big white domes? Yes. Yeah, right there, that's where the, uh, the island popped up out of the ocean originally. And if you go up there, uh, look on topo maps or, you know, an aerial photograph, you can actually see um, how that was a small island that came up. And I say oh, okay. right around there on well, Crest Road goes up and goes to the um, the radar domes. You know, Crest, is that Crest Road? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Crest Road. Well, right as it goes around the bend, which was probably the end of the island, uh, you can find abalone shells in the roadside there. Okay, so the circumference of the original island is just that small little area up there by the road air domes. It's yeah, not it's a very small down. Expo too, yeah. Huh, so uh, it really collided. It's, it's not like we don't see much of the original island. No, I just pushed up the top there, yeah. But, um, yeah, just well, I mean, yeah. the PV Drive uh, West, that's part of the island. That was one border. Well, one thing interesting, uh, I, we talked about the marine terraces. You know how they have the stair steps? Uh, most of the main roads in Palos Verdes are built around the marine terraces. Wow. That's a good way to finding them sometimes. You can just look down on a map and all these circular uh, roads are actually going around the marine terraces because they were flat. You know, the sea cliffs, you know, the flat terrace and the sea cliff. So uh, a lot of the roads in Palos Verdes are actually on the marine terraces. Okay. Hey, Joe, quick question. Uh, you showed a, a beautiful painting of the Indians attacking the uh, prehistoric <laughs> bison that you discovered. Where, where is that painting at? That painting? Yes. Oh, it is something I found on the internet. I don't know anything about it. I, I It was just kind of an example, but I, I, I really think, though, that... Uh, that bison was probably killed by a very small group of people. 
because I think those Paleo Indians, they were just real small groups, family groups, and uh, they didn't migrate around, and they probably, maybe could have been one bison, it's hard to say. But it kind of showed how they trapped them in that canyon. Yeah, whether or not it's factual, it's still a beautiful illustration of yeah. the Indians in, in the territory where you discovered it. I, I think it would make a phenomenal exhibit. Yeah, well, wait, the bone is on display at PVIC, the pelvis. Yes. He's, yeah. saying, the, um, he's saying the picture as well. Yeah, I like I, I, we should someday I get, have someone make a nice picture of that. It would be good because um, it's just a lot of focus. And it, it's just, I think if we had that same picture with maybe one bison and, you know, six guys around it killing it, it might be more realistic. Well, who can call you a liar if you claim there was a dozen? Uh, maybe 11. I'm not really sure. There you go. Yeah. 